Welcome, everyone, to the Power of Positive Leadership Teleseminar with bestselling author and speaker John Gordon. My name is Daniel Decker, and I'll be your co-host today. During this call, John will share several proven principles and practices that make great leaders great. We'll also spend some time, if time permits, at the end of the call answering some of your questions that you've submitted. Uh, and there were some really good ones, so be sure to stay all the way through, because I think you'll uh, definitely find some benefit of what John's able to answer there at the end, too. And I also want to encourage you, if you haven't done so yet, uh, or even if you have, grab another one. But uh, John's latest book, which this teleseminar is based on, is The Power of Positive Leadership. Uh, it contains a lot more than what we're going to be able to cover in, in this call today, but definitely grab a copy for yourself and for your team, uh, especially if you find value in this in this call today. It's available anywhere books are sold, including Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, and powerofpositiveleadership.com. That's powerofpositiveleadership.com. With that said, we'll go ahead and uh, dive in. John, um, let's bring some context uh, to all this. I know we've got a lot of people who are familiar with you and a lot of who are new with you uh, today and maybe some who have read the book or, and who haven't. But why, uh, you know, you've gone from the energy bus to, to soup and carpenter and training camp, but why the power of positive leadership? Why was that book important for you to do now? Well, in 2007, Daniel, you know, I wrote the energy bus. And so for the past 10 years, I've had the opportunity to speak to so many different leaders, organizations, uh, schools, businesses, sports teams, and I've worked with so many great leaders. I've learned so much from them. I'm a, I'm a student first and a teacher second. So I've learned all these great things, and for the past 10 years, I wanted to put all that I've learned into one book, and so that became the power of positive leadership. And this is why and how positive leaders transform their teams, their organizations, and ultimately change the world. And so these are principles, you know, from the energy bus that have evolved into, you know, proven practices and how great leaders lead, why they make a difference, and how they have an impact. So, I mean, what is uh, – people look at, you know, in a leadership position, sometimes can look at positivity as a soft skill or Pollyanna. So what does positive leadership actually mean to you? Right, we really shouldn't have to say, you know, positive and leader in the same sentence, right? It should just be leader because to be a leader, you need to be positive. You need to see the road ahead. You need to have a vision of where you're going. You need to be optimistic and positive through your challenges, through all the adversity. So you really shouldn't have to put them together, but, but I like to because positive leaders – ultimately the ones who change the world through their optimism, through their belief, through their positivity, and they inspire others to do the same. They, they rally people. Think about it. Pessimists don't change the world. Critics write words, but they don't write the future. Naysayers talk about problems, but they don't solve them. It's ultimately the positive leaders, the believers, the dreamers, the doers that have a huge impact. And throughout history, we've seen that over and over again, and we see it to this day. Now, I know I've worked with you for 15-plus years, so we, we get this a lot. Other people are like, oh, well, that's easy for you, John Gordon. Uh, you're, you're writing books. You're out there speaking. You're traveling the world. Right. But uh, I know firsthand, and some who are new might not know this, but, I mean, the, the, one of the best things is you aren't just prescribing something that you haven't gone through yourself. So, I mean, you were negative, and you've turned into being much more positive. How has that worked for you? Yeah, there's a good chapter in the book, From Negative to Positive, and that's been my journey. You know, I, I tell people all the time I'm not naturally positive. I grew up in Long Island, New York, in a Jewish-Italian family, a lot of food, a lot of guilt, a lot of wine, a lot of whining, and so I've had to work really hard to be positive. You know, my dad was a New York City cop, undercover narcotics. He was shot a few times. He wasn't too big on positive energy, my dad. A very loving man, but you get up in the morning and say, hey, good morning, Daddy. You say, what's so good about it? I often joke that my dad was Al Bundy before Al Bundy was Al Bundy. I know that many people on this call probably have no idea what Al Bundy is, but that's the environment I grew up in. And so I've had to work to be positive. And around my late 20s, early 30s, it came to a head. My, my wife had enough of my negativity. I mean, she really gave me an ultimatum. like, ah, you need to change or you're off the bus. And so I begged her to stay. I agreed to change. And I worked on being a more positive person myself. I mean, I really put the work in over time. So we teach what we need to learn. Unfortunately, too often people resist the most what they need the most. 
but I knew I needed this, and so it became my life's work to become more positive myself and then share with others. You know, there's a part of the book where, you know, my, my daughter, when she was applying to college, she wrote her, her college essay and it said, when I was young, my mom struggled with her health and my dad struggled with himself. But I watched as my dad worked to become a more positive person. And then he started to write and speak about this. And I saw people change because of his work. He changed. And if they can change, I know the world can change. And it really brought tears to my eyes because I saw how my one decision to be a more positive person, a more positive leader, not only impacted me, but it impacted everyone around me. And I tell people all the time that, that being a positive leader doesn't just impact you. It impacts everyone around you. It doesn't just make you better. It makes everyone around you better. This is not Pollyanna positive. This is the kind of positive leadership that we're talking about that allows us to overcome the negativity in the world, the negativity in our organizations. It helps us overcome every challenge that every person and team will face on their journey. You will face challenges. How do we overcome them to continue to move forward? How do we become our best and bring out the best in others in the face of all these obstacles that we're going to face on the journey? That's positive leadership. So it's not Pollyanna. This really is about finding the way forward. Now, how's that work for you uh, now? I mean, is it – are you reconditioned where you're feeling yourself that you're just more naturally positive or are you still having to work at it just as hard? <clears throat> oh, yeah. I mean, every day I have to work at it, but I, I've become a lot more positive. Like, I used to wake up and be like, oh, another day. You know, now <laughs> I wake up, I'm like, all right, take on the day. And so it really has changed. I mean, the mind is like a garden. Every day you got to weed it and feed it. And if you just do it one day, it's not going to do much, right, weeding and feeding. But say you weed and feed that garden for a week. Say you do it for a month. Say you do it for a year, seven years. Now, for me, it's been about 15 years. That garden starts to look pretty magnificent over time. Now, of course, you still get weeds that come up every now and then. But you just got to make sure you pull them and, and then keep feeding, keep nourishing, keep fueling up with that positivity. I recognize when – that negativity is coming out. I recognize when I'm having a bad day. I wrote the positive pledge, which we put in the power of positive leadership. <laughs> it's also in the positive dog. As a result of my daughter, uh, a couple of years ago, came out to me like, uh, Dad, you need to read your own book, she said. <laughs> and after she said that, I was like, you know what? You're right. I do. I'm, I'm having a bad day. I actually was having a bad week. I need to be positive. And so I wrote this positive pledge that really has been sort of my, my, my calling in terms of, all right, I'm going to approach – you know, life this way as much as I can every day. So my, my bad days are, are farther and few between now. I, I have very few of them. They still happen, but I, I see them now and I know what I'm experiencing and I know how to overcome them by just, you know, what I write about in this book and, and what I've learned to, uh, to live and breathe every day. I love it. Um, in the book and throughout, I mean, you get the opportunity to spend a lot of time with um, high-level leaders, people who are uh, winning sports championships, to CEOs that are um, running massive organizations and, and nonprofits. What are some examples of positive leaders that that you've encountered, and and what you know, what are the things that they're doing that make they're making an impact for you? Well, someone who I wrote about in the book was Alan Mulally. Alan Mulally, uh, you know, I don't always pronounce his name right, but he is one of the greatest leadership greatest leaders in, in history. I mean, when he took over Ford, they were losing $14 billion. He had them profitable in a, in a few short years. One of the greatest leadership feats in history, people say. They said it was like Churchill-like what he did. So I had a chance to interview him for the book. We we talked for about an hour, maybe a little bit longer, and I feel like I got an MBA in that one hour. I mean, this mm. gentleman is just incredible. And when he took over Ford, he said, John, we were mul multiple Fords. We were regionalized. There was a lot of dysfunction. We had, become, we had to become one Ford with one team, with one plan, one goal. Everyone had to know the plan. Everyone had to embrace the plan. Everyone had to relentlessly work towards the plan. And he had a working together management system where he was able to get everyone in Ford to start working together. And his positive leadership made all the difference. Think about it. In 2006, He's doing everything right. They're restructuring. He's 
putting together his management system, getting people to work together, getting rid of the dysfunction, creating a lot of accountability, doing everything right. And 2008 comes along, and the Great Recession hits. And so now no one's buying cars. And so everyone's just freaking out because they were doing everything right, but now no one is buying cars. So people were getting very pessimistic, very nervous, very fearful. He said, we have a plan. If we need to adjust, we will. But we have a plan, and we will find a way forward. And people talk about his leadership. A great book, American Icon, really details the specifics that I read after my conversation with him. He said I should read it. I did. One of the best books I've ever read in terms of, of leadership and detailed leadership about what he did. But he, most importantly, his optimism, his belief in his, himself and his team and Ford, his steadfast approach. If he's not the leader of Ford, Ford is not saved. Ford goes bankrupt. If he's not the leader of Ford, thousands of people likely would have lost their job. I've met people since this book's come out who have told me how Alan Mulally changed their life and saved their jobs. So that's the kind of leadership that we're talking about, just incredible. Another great Example is, you know, Dabo Sweeney. People know I've worked with Clemson football for the past six years, and just the kind of leader that he is. And when he took over that program, he was meeting with the board of trustees. He was interim head coach. And they said, you know, Coach, we want to be like Georgia. We want to be like Michigan. We want to be like Ohio State. We want to build a program and be like them. Dabo said he couldn't help himself. He wanted to stay quiet, but he just couldn't help himself. And he said, sir... He said, I respectfully disagree. My vision is so much bigger than that. He said, I want to create a program where they want to be like us. That's what I want. And he had this big and bold vision of what Clemson football would be. Not everyone shared that vision, but he had this incredible vision. Well, he asked his AD for a TV for his office so he can watch film in his office. The AD said, we don't have it in the budget. So he goes out to like a Best Buy or one of the stores to go buy – a TV for his office. He still has that TV in his office as a reminder of that time. Well, they just moved to a $55 million facility this year for Clemson wow. football with all the TVs that Dabo wants. There's thousands <laughs> all over the place. And we laughed about his office. Like, you couldn't even get a TV, and now you have this building. It's not the building. The building is just really a testament to someone's vision and their positive leadership of how he was able to get everyone on board to rally towards his vision and his optimism and his belief. When he got the job, his first meeting with the team, he brought in two signs to his team. One said, believe. The other one said, I can't, with the T crossed out. And he was basically instilling belief in his team from that, that moment, saying, we're going to be a team that believes. And I've been there, and I've watched over the past six years, how he brainwashes them in a, in a positive way, right? We're all brainwashing, you know, every day, whether it's a positive belief or a negative belief. And he brainwashes them with belief day in and day out. And that's what I find about the great leaders, that they, they have such great belief that they believe in their team more than their team believes in themselves. That leadership mm -hmm. is a transfer of belief. So they're always transferring their belief to others. Donna Orinder did this as well. When she took over the WNBA as commissioner, she's another great example of, of positive leadership. There was not a lot of support for the WNBA, but she brought this incredible belief system to the WNBA and was able to turn it around and make it a, you know, a sport, a watchable sport, an exciting sport, and also a, a an organization of belief and optimism that people started to galvanize and support. And it was all because of her leadership and how she cultivated the belief of her people within the office. You win in the locker room first. I wrote a book called You Win in the Locker Room with Mike Smith. And then you win on the field. You win in your office first. You win with your team first. And then you win out in the marketplace. But it starts with leading your team first. And then there's, you know, great leaders like Sarah Blakely, like, you know, incredible leaders like that. She's the founder of Spanx and, and just the the impact that she had. I mean, she was selling what fax machines, door to door. Fax machines, door to door. Rejection after rejection. She comes up with this idea for pantyhose that's that's different than anyone had ever thought of. And she winds up build, building it into a billion dollar empire. She believed. Other people didn't. She had a vision. Other people didn't share it. 
She was rejected with the idea when she took it to all the manufacturers. Only one person, a guy who had daughters, agreed to look at it, liked the idea, said, let's do it. And next thing you know, the rest is history. I love that. Her story is a great one too. So let's get real, let's get practical for, for a minute on that. You know, so say I'm a, I'm a leader in an organization or, uh, or I'm new to an organization. I've got a vision. Uh, I, I believe in it. Um, I'm being met with resistance. You know, I've got the people that are around me that either, either can't see the vision yet or maybe they're, um, hostile against it, uh, negative. Um, how, how do you deal with that environment? And is there a certain amount of time that you need to allow? before you let people you make that decision that someone's just not on the bus, or how does that work? Well, the framework starts with culture and then vision. So as a leader, you have to build your culture and say, okay, this is what we stand for. This is what we're about. You have to have people who stand for what you stand for. You have to bring them into the fold. You have to get them to buy in. You have to include them in the process. And then you have to say, okay, this is our vision, or let's create our vision together. Again, it works differently. Sometimes as a leadership team, you have to go and say, this is our vision. And other times you say, okay, let's create our vision together. And when you do that, now everyone is coming together to create a vision for the road ahead. They're creating a North Star. I call it the telescope. They're pulling out their telescope and they're seeing the future together. This is where we want to go. This is why we want to go there. That's purpose. We'll talk about that later. But this is why we want to go there. And so you have a vision that everyone needs to be aligned towards. What I love to do is is work with leaders to have them share a vision or come up with a vision as a team and then have each person share how their vision contributes to the bigger vision. So if I'm the leader, okay, here's our vision. What's your vision? And how can your vision help us achieve our vision? And then how can I help you achieve your vision? So now we're working together for you to achieve the bigger vision, me to help you with your vision and how do you want me to hold you accountable? This is a great way to make vision practical and bring it to life and then enhance engagement and relationships in the process. So as a leader, you're working with your team towards their vision, the bigger vision, engagement, and that's where you get true transformation and change. You mentioned uh, that's part of the framework. So what is the framework? We've got a framework in uh, the Power of Positive Leadership book, but can you go through what the framework is? Sure. It's, well, it starts with positive leaders drive positive cultures. Positive leaders create a vision for the road ahead. So where are we going and then how are we getting there together? Positive leaders lead with optimism, positivity, and belief. So we have this vision, but we're going to face challenges and obstacles and negativity. So we have to have that positivity, optimism, belief as we move forward. We're going to deal with negativity. So positive leaders confront, transform, and remove negativity. You have to Deal with the negativity that exists. One of the biggest mistakes that leaders make is they don't confront the negativity. And so negativity winds up sabotaging the team and the organization. So we have to deal with the negativity. And once you do that, you create a fertile environment. You, you feed the positive, you weed the negative, and you create an environment where, where you can now do your best work as a leader. You create united and connected teams. That's what positive leaders do. They create united and connected teams. They unite the organization and they connect with the individual. And that leads us to the next part of the framework where positive leaders build great relationships and teams. Relationships are the foundation upon which winning teams are built. So they really develop these relationships that allow everyone to work together towards the vision. You can have the greatest vision in the world, but if you don't have relationships with your people and you're not someone they want to follow, it doesn't matter. Their vision is pointless. Or we say a, a mission statement is pointless unless you have people on a mission. And you can have the greatest core values in the world, but, again, they're pointless unless you live and breathe them every day. So it's through the relationships and it's through the coaching and guidance and, and mentoring, developing, that you really, truly motivate people to work towards the vision. And then positive leaders pursue excellence. We're not about – Pollyanna positive. Again, we are pursuing excellence together. Positive leaders are demanding. They are demanding. They're just not demeaning. So they're demanding, but not demeaning. But they're here to pursue excellence together. 
and they do want to win. So it's not like, hey, we're just positive, we're having fun. No, we are positive to do something great. We believe in a brighter and better future. We believe that the future should be better. We are here to pursue our best future and the best version of ourselves, and that requires excellence in the process. And then positive leaders, they lead with purpose. We, we can't do any of this without purpose because there are going to be days we get up. We don't feel very positive. And that's where we need a bigger purpose that fuels our positivity. That's where our positivity is empowered and driven by the purpose that we have. We don't get burned out because of what we do. We get burned out because we forget why we do it. So positive leaders, they lead with purpose. They inspire purpose in their teams. And then together, they work for a bigger purpose. And then positive leaders, they have grit, right? They face all the obstacles, they face the challenges, they face the setbacks, but they just keep moving forward. They don't give up. And I just love that quality. And people, no matter, you know, where you are in the spectrum of, of, of leadership within your role within a company or an organization, you just have grit and you keep moving forward. And, Daniel, I want to say that even though we're talking about leadership, and you may not lead a lot of people if you're listening to this call, but I want to say that if, if you lead one person, you are a leader. And every one of us is a leader because every one of us has the ability to influence the people around us. I often joke that I, you know, I lead a team at work, but I'm second in command of my team at home, you know. And then, <laughs> and then, um, you know, <laughs> my wife leads the way. And then, well, then I got a teenage daughter, right? So she's 19 now, so I'm, I'm third in command. And then, I, well, then you bring in the, you bring in the cats, and I don't even lead yeah. them. <laughs> So I would say, you know, my son and I are probably working together a lot these days, so I'm leading him. Okay, I lead one person at least. So I know that I'm a leader of one, and yet I'm still a leader for that one person. That's a really important point. I want to go back to um, talk. just ask you a question about confronting negativity because there's something that people often misunderstand with that. But real quick for those who are listening, if you jump on uh, powerofpositiveleadership.com, at the top you'll see a link that says Posters. And that framework that John was just talking about, and we'll send this out in the call replay, but um, that poster or that framework that John was just talking about, we do have that in a downloadable poster. So you can take that, print it out, give it to your team, put it up at your water cooler, um, break room, whatever, just to reinforce those uh, that framework and the values that John was just speaking of. Because I think it's really important that, you know, when you're listening to these calls, or any type of uh, improvement or betterment for your team, you've got to take it forward. You can't just, you know, get off the call and be that, wow, that was great, and take a quote, but you've got to carry it forward. And while you're there on the side, Daniel, also I want to go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I want to just add one thing to that. You're, you're so right because one important thing is that, you know, talks like this are great. Seminars are great. I've worked with the L.A. Rams this year, the Dodgers this year, and then I also, you know, joke, but I also worked with the Cleveland Browns a few years ago. So not every team I work with wins. And what I've learned is that, you know, the talks and books don't win championships it, and don't ultimately transform the team. It's really the leader that is always doing that. So it's about taking these ideas that we're talking about today, and then my goal is that people will take action on them. So go ahead. Sorry about that. Just want to share that. Uh, no, it's great. That's perfect. No, um, also on the site, we've got a positive leader self-assessment that you can take. Just, some, you know, on the site, there's a bunch of resources, things that are in the book, additional um, resources that are on the site, and most of these are free that you can go and take advantage of individually or with your team. Uh, but just, I mean, really the, the point is don't just let this be a one-off deal. Take it and make it and take it further within yourself, your team, or those that are around you. But going back, John, to the confronting negativity, we get this often because, you know, a popular uh, phrase that you or, or topic you have is about energy vampires and dealing with them. So how does that work, you know, in, in the practical sense of someone who has someone who is negative um, within their team or their structure and they're, they are confronting them and do they, because people misunderstand this, like they should just kick anybody off the bus that's, that's negative. How do you suggest that people work with that and is there a time that they, you know, at some point, you know, when do they give up and say, hey, you're not the right fit here? Yeah, that's been the biggest challenge, I think, in terms of uh, with the energy bus is that when I get the emails from people that says, hey, you know, my boss gave me your book, but they're the biggest energy vampire of all. What should I do? Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, I'm on a team with an energy vampire. What do I do? I'm not in charge of hiring or firing them. What should I do? And I get a lot of those kind of questions. So one thing I, I really delved into this a lot more in the power of positive leadership, I wanted to address these issues. And one thing I shared was that, don't be negative about negativity. And so negativity will exist, but if we become negative about it, 
we wind up lowering ourselves to the problem, and then we can't solve the problem. We can't deal with the issue. So make sure you stay above it. Make sure you stay positive. You're not here to say you're either on my bus or off my bus. That's not the purpose of the energy bus to say you're either on it or off it. It's really about getting people to want to be on it, to be the kind of leader where people feel like they want to be on your bus. We have a, a training program called Driver of Positive Change where we help managers become better leaders. Well, in one of our programs for a company, we had a, a woman leader, and one of the exercises is where you write a love letter to your energy vampire. Now, we call it a love letter, but it's a letter of encouragement. It's a letter to that energy vampire to let them know what you appreciate about, appreciate about them, what what you see great in them. First of all, they don't know that you think they're an energy vampire, right? So you don't let them know that you're a vampire. But you really find that person that has been sucking the energy from you, and you write them an encouraging letter and a, and a, and a positive letter. Well, this woman did that who came through our program. She then met with her. It was supposed to only be a 30-minute conversation. It wound up being a two-hour conversation. They had this incredible talk, found out some of the stuff that she was dealing with. Next thing you know, they become like great friends, transforms the relationship, transforms the team, and this leader said it transformed the way she led people going forward. And I think so often we just rush to judgment, thinking someone's negative, they're an energy vampire, but we don't make the effort to find out what's really going on with that person. So first we identify it. That's the key. First identify it, then we confront it. So we, we have to deal with it in a, in a positive way and address it and maybe find out what's going on with that person. So let's address the negativity that exists in a positive way. Then let's try to transform it. That's the next step. Transform it with empathy, with mentoring, with coaching, with guidance, with your own love, right? So let's try to transform it. If that doesn't work and we do everything and we know we're doing everything right, we know that we have become a great leader. We know that we are loving and serving and caring. We know that we are addressing it and really trying to help that person transform. And they're not willing to change. And they're sabotaging the team and the organization. And they're hurting others. Well, at that point, we have to let them off the bus. But what I often say is, you don't have to let them out of your life. You can still seek out that person and reach out to them and letting, let them know you're here for them, even though they're no longer on the team. So I think the last resort is to let them off the bus, is to remove them. But what I'm really big on now is helping to transform. And and I'm I'm yeah. very, you know, aware and very, you know, very understanding that, you know what, not everyone's going to change, right? There are people that no matter what we do, and those people may need to get on another bus somewhere else. We had a school principal and, you know, get, sent out bus tickets to everyone, and everyone brought in their bus tickets saying, hey, I'm on the bus. Two teachers came back and said, we're not getting on the bus. Well, those two teachers, by the end of the year, were on another bus. And they said it transformed the school. Like, all of a sudden, there was levity. There was excitement. People were happy about being there. And here's the deal. If we have a mission, if we're here to do something great as a team and as an organization, and we have people sabotaging that mission, they have to go. Especially in schools, if our, if our desire is to transform the school, to impact children's lives and help them become great adults, successful people, great people, and that's our goal in school, to help kids do that. And if you have someone who has come to hate kids and they're still teaching, if you have someone who is sabotaging the other teachers and they're sabotaging the mission, well, then that person has to go. And so we've seen a lot of negativity in education, and that's why we created the Energy Bus for Schools program to build positive cultures in schools and help positive leaders do that. We start with five model schools. We now have over 100 schools. It's amazing how it's working because we're using these principles to deal with the negativity, build the positivity, and then a lot of people we're finding are just getting off the bus themselves. You don't have to kick them off because they don't like the light. <laughs> they don't like the negativity. Yeah. They don't, I mean, they don't like the positivity. They're negative, so they get off. Yeah, it just has a way of weeding them out on their own a lot of times. We had one teacher, she came up to her principal at the end of the year, and she said, you know what? She said, I, I can't do this job anymore. It's just too positive here. I, I can't do it. And, and she left. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's a great reason. Absolutely. Yeah. So are these, you know, in that, you know, of how, how people are dealing with the, that, is that the, are those the same type principles when, you know, from a leader who's trying to create great relationships overall and build great teams? Is it the same strategies within that, or are there others, you know, for building the relationships and teams overall? 
Well, there are others for building the teams, and again, we delve into a lot of that in the book in terms of encouragement and making time for connection and developing relationships and communicating and committing and caring, and there's a lot of great practical ways to develop relationships, but let's just say for the purpose of, 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 this, of this call, it's about making time to invest in relationships, knowing those relationships are going to help you build a great team and organization. So often we are so busy and stressed as people and leaders that we don't make the time for the relationships because the busyness and stress is keeping us from what matters most. And so we have to make time to invest in those relationships. Don't allow busyness and stress to keep you from caring from the people that you're supposed to care about. And that's what happens so often. We're busy and stressed. We activate the reptilian part of our brain. So we become all about survival instead of helping people thrive. We're just trying to survive. So we're not taking the time to invest in people because we're just trying to get through the day ourselves. So when you can be aware of that and recognize the busyness and stress and recognize how you're activating that reptilian part of your brain, you can take a deep breath. You can be intentional. You can... Be thankful because you can't be stressed and thankful at the same time, and you can focus on what matters most and invest in that relationship. I think about that uh, one, I believe it was a principal that you reference a lot or occasionally of, uh, that wrote all the thank you cards or uh, or Doug Conant, you know, or people like that. that it's like people that are way busier than a lot of us, um, you know, with the responsibilities they have, but they still find a way to make the, the most important things the most important. Exactly. Communication builds trust. Trust generates commitment. Commitment fosters teamwork, and teamwork delivers results. So it all starts with that great communication. And then from there, you want to create connection. What I have found is that the best leaders connect with their people, not just collectively, but one-on-one. We have to make time for the connection to build great relationships. I often joke about this, but it's true. I remember my son coming in, hey, Dad, you want to play ping pong? I said, no, I'm too busy. He comes in again. Dad, you want to play ping pong? And I said, I'm, I'm too busy. I'm, I'm writing a book about engaged relationships. <laughs> and so here I wasn't making time for the most important relationship of all. And in that moment, I recognized it. I said, okay, i got to make this a priority. And it changed the way I parented, changed the way I led, and made connection a big priority. So um, earlier in the call, you, you referenced purpose. A lot, and we've talked about it a little bit here, but why, I mean, obviously purpose is important, but why from a leadership perspective is it probably one of the, one of the most important things from a transfer of belief perspective? Because we're here for a reason. We exist for a reason. We're not here by accident. And every great organization, as Steve Jobs said, has a noble purpose for why they exist. So I believe the organization exists for a reason. I believe you exist for a reason. And I believe your why is what powers you. That purpose is what fuels you. Every day we're going to face challenges, obstacles, and setbacks. And so to be positive, we need a purpose to give us something to be positive about. The research shows that more people die Monday morning at 9 a.m. than any other time. That is a true stat. More people die Monday morning, 9 a.m. than any other time. People would rather die than go to work. Think about that. It's because they've lost their purpose. And so a purpose for an individual is what powers them each day. And we, we so easily forget our purpose. We lose our perspective because we're dealing with so much clutter and so much stuff that we forget it's about perhaps making a difference one person at a time. So my purpose is to inspire and empower as many people as possible one person at a time. I want to make time for that one purpose. My purpose is about positivity, is sharing positivity with others. I know that. I mean, there were, there were years that I forgot it, and I got drained, and I got burned out. But when I remember my purpose, and that purpose fuels me, I never get tired. I never get drained. My purpose keeps me fresh. And so I think it's the greatest power source in the universe is the purpose that fuels us. And spiritually, I believe that God created, and spiritually, I believe God created us for a purpose. And so when God, God created us with a purpose, we then live on purpose, and that's why purpose is so important. Yeah, so that, I mean, for people who are like, well, John, I mean, organizationally, it's one thing, but individually, the people who are struggling with feeling like they they lack purpose or don't know, I mean, I know you talk a lot about the fact that just you've got to live on purpose and your purpose will find you. Yeah, and it starts with three words that I wrote in The Carpenter, love, serve, care. Find ways to love others, find ways to serve, find ways to show that you care. If you do those three things, love, serve, care, 
you'll be living on purpose. And what happens is when you start to serve in small ways, you get more opportunities to serve in bigger ways. And I always say don't chase success. Decide to make a difference and success will find you. And don't seek happiness, right? We live in a world that's obsessed with happiness. No, happiness is a byproduct of living with passion and purpose. And so if you're purposeful, you'll be more positive and you'll be happier, but it starts with the purpose, and that starts with loving, serving, and caring. I love it. I want to make sure we've got uh, time to answer a few of the questions. There's sure. hundreds of them. <laughs> and, uh, there's some really good ones, so I'm just going to pick a few at, at random here. Um, but one, and it, we addressed a little bit, but um, here is how do you – I'm thinking love tough on this, uh, but how do you balance being a positive leader and not allowing team members to ignore goals, vision, et cetera? Yep. A big part of this book, Alan Mulally taught me this. Dabo Sweeney lives by this. Every great leader I've spoken to leads in this way. Love and accountability. Love and accountability are the two keys together. Love tough. Not tough love, but love tough. I believe in tough love. But it works when love comes first. If your team knows you love them, then they will allow you to challenge them and push them and hold them accountable to the standards. Alan Mulally told me, John, you've got to love them up. You've got to love them up. But you've got to hold them accountable to the culture, the values, and the principles and the standards of your organization, of your team. So that's how you do it together, love and accountability. It's tough to do, but you have to master the combination of those two. And if you do, you will have a great team. It's no different than parenting. I've learned with my kids, like, right, I have to love them, and they have to know I love them. But I also have to help them become the best that they can be. And if you really love someone, you won't let them settle for mediocrity. You won't let them settle for anything but their best. So you'll, you'll expect more from them and help them, you know, rise up to a higher standard. But you're not letting them do it on their own. You're doing it with them. And that's positive leadership. We're doing this together. And it's crazy how it works, though, because we all, we, uh, for those of us who've been on the receiving uh, side of it, and I have with you, I mean, 15 years of us working together, it's at the time sometimes when that love tough is happening, it's frustrated. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you always come like that's why I love it because it always makes me better. It's like if I take a moment afterwards to think, oh wow, okay, I, I, there was a point in that. So people have got to realize that too. It's okay to let the tension is good sometimes. Yeah, sometimes again we have to have some constructive conflict to have a great team. Great teams fight, right? They're going to have disagreements. And so you have to sometimes have those constructive conflicts in order to grow. It's not the fighting that hurts the team. It's the fact that there's no trust and love and respect. This is where we are as a country right now. We're losing the trust, love, and respect of each other. Conflict is good because you have to come together to, to sometimes, just as you do sometimes, where we argue with ideas and things we should do. And, and sometimes, as you know, I admit I'm wrong. Like, you're right, Daniel. You were right on that. I was wrong. And so you have to disagree, but you have to have the love and trust and respect of each other. And if you do, the fighting then makes you stronger. It makes your family stronger. Then that's a good, perfect segue into another one of the questions. So how do you get team members to trust positive intentions with each other without assuming the worst? Well, you have to bring them together as a team. It doesn't happen by accident. I mean, you really have to help your team connect to be committed. So you'll never have commitment from your team without connection. So I'm a big believer in positive leaders getting their teams to come together and connect. For instance, I love the defining moment exercise. I have teams, executive teams, teams of all sorts where they come together and at your next team building meeting or your next meeting, even a staff meeting, each person goes around and shares a defining moment in their life. Hey, let's get to know each other better. Let's learn each other's story. When you know someone's story, you get to know them a whole lot better. I've never seen this fail where a team goes around and shares a defining moment that helped them become who they are. And when you do that, you start to increase connection. And when you have that connection, you have more commitment and you have trust. And, again, it's something I've worked with the Dodgers on for the last two years. Uh, saw it in the Rams this year. You know, you see it in the, uh, the Titans as well. You see it in the teams that are connected, and you see how they stay connected. Miami Heat, worked with them last year. The Miami Heat started 11 and 30. They finished 30 and 11, where most of the teams that weren't connected were giving up. These guys were actually very connected and committed to each other. So they kept on fighting for each other, 
pushing through for each other, and you saw how that connection and commitment played out in the second half. Again, you can tell when a team is connected, and you can tell when they're committed. And so that's the case. So you, trust doesn't happen by accident. You have to cultivate the connections and the relationships that then do it. And you don't do it, right, like as a one-off. You have to see it as a process and say, you know what, we are going to be a strong team. And as a leader, I'm going to work with my team to help us become stronger, to get to know each other. And you may not like everybody, right? There, it doesn't mean you may, not, you may like everyone, but you can truly respect and get to know each other and appreciate each other's story and where they came from. I just saw an article that someone sent to me about a, a team that won the Australian Rules football. Uh, they won it in Australia first time in 36 years. And they did the defining moment exercise. They did my Triple H exercise, hero, hardship, highlight, hero, hardship, highlight. And each person shared with the team. This article talked about how this team truly bonded and became connected because they got to know each other. Several guys were brought to tears. It was so cool to see that a team in Australia, you know, a team like the Cleveland Browns, who hasn't won in years, who had a, a very dysfunctional culture, uses this, builds their culture, becomes a great team, and they wind up winning the championship. Again, sports is just a great example for what we can accomplish in any organization. Because you see it play out within a year, but I've seen, I've seen the same impact in businesses and schools when leaders do this with their teams. I love it. So we've got uh, time for maybe one more question, and then I'll let you wrap up with a final thought. But uh, this one's a, a good one about change. So our company is undergoing a significant change. People are concerned about their jobs and, the, and their security. How do I best work with people through the change, even when I'm uncertain about the future myself? Yeah, the key is to be honest and be transparent and just be there for them and, and always talk about where you are now and then where are we going. Again, here's where we are and here's where we're going. And yes, maybe where we're going is uncertain, but let's stay positive about where we're going. Let's have a positive vision that no matter what happens, we're going to be okay, even if there's layoffs. I saw a superintendent of a school district. They had a layoff about a 1,000 people in the school district. I was there speaking at the meeting, and he got a standing ovation because he was so honest and transparent. And over the years, he had earned so much trust and respect and love from everyone. They knew that this is not something he wanted to do. He, he had to do. And so he was very open and honest and he gets a standing ovation letting people know they're going to lose their jobs. And no one knew who was going to lose their jobs. So that also brings us to faith instead of fear. So as a leader, we have to inspire faith in others instead of fear. I wrote a book, The Shark and the Goldfish. Change is going to happen. But what we have to do as leaders and teams is embrace this change and then ride that wave to a successful future. And we have to choose faith instead of fear no matter what we're going through. And so, again, going back as a leader, you talk about the change that's happening. You're honest. You don't know where we're ultimately going. But you say, let's show up every day and give our best each day and do what we can do. Control what we can control, trusting that no matter what happens, that the future is bright for each one of us. And even if someone's going to lose their job, it's still going to lead to something great. And that person knows that they can count on you, that even if they leave, that you're going to help them find something. You're going to work with them. You're going to work with each member of the team. You're there for them. So you're leading in the trenches with them, having a relationship with them, and helping guide them towards the future and dealing with the current change that exists. I love it. And that, that's a, a good reminder, too, of the uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. Let's avoid negativity. We'll fill it. Right, because if people are uncertain and there's this void of communication, negativity is going to flood in, more rumors, more gossip, a lot of disengagement. People are going to quit before they quit. I've been in environments like that. I've actually worked for a dot-com that was crashing, and no one knew what was going on. There was not a lot of communication, and there was a ton of disengagement. And I remember I was just like holding on for dear life at the time, but lost my job. And then when I lost my job, it led me to do this work now. And so what was bad led to good. And Gallup has done a study, and they asked people to identify the worst event in their life and the best. And they found an 80% correlation between the two, that somehow the worst event leads to the best if you're willing to just continue to move forward through the change. That's amazing. 
Well, John, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do this today. And for everyone who's listening in, I'll let you wrap up with a final thought. But just to remind everyone listening to, just jump on, on to powerofpositiveleadership.com. Uh, again, that's powerofpositiveleadership.com where you can find the resources that we mentioned. You can find links to the book. You can pick up a copy for yourself and your team. Um, there's an action plan that's downloadable that you can use as a uh, accompaniment guide, which is a great uh, resource, too, to get your team together and kind of go through some actionable items to, to turn these ideas into realities. Uh, but, John, just wrap us up uh, today with any uh, parting advice or, or a recap word that you want to share. I want to say tonight I'm going to try to get on a Facebook Live around 8 o'clock, so 8 o'clock East Coast time. If anyone wants to join me, just want to let you know I'll be doing that, sharing some of the principles we talked about today. Not a long one, maybe just 15 minutes, but I'm just thinking about that would be cool to do something uh, video. This was audio, and I thought, okay, maybe we'll do a Facebook Live later to do something video-wise. But I want to, I want to leave with talking about a legacy because ultimately that should be our goal as a positive leader is to impact people's lives in the work that we do, and then my friend says live a legacy and also leave a legacy. I think it's it's great to do both, right? Let's live it, let's leave it. And as we do, we transform our teams, organizations, our families in the process. What is a legacy? It's lives touched and stories told. Lives touched, stories told. Whose life can you touch today? Whose life can you impact in a positive way? And how can you live in such a way that people will tell stories about you years from now? What kind of stories do you want them to tell? Because let me tell you something. If you're on a team or any organization, if you're a leader, 20, 30 years from now, people will be telling stories about you. What kind of stories do you want them to tell? John Tillman is my friend from the University of Maryland. He's the head coach of the lacrosse team there. We played together at Cornell. They just won a national championship last year. We talk and we still remember, you know, what we were like in college and we remember each other from college and now, you know, he's winning national championships. And it's just so cool to to look back and remember those stories that we experienced together and now who we are now. I think that's the journey of life. Like, let's create great stories together right now. Let's leave great legacies and let's touch a lot of lives. If we do that, we are positive leaders who are driven by purpose and we're changing the world in the process. So I want to thank everyone for being on this call with me. Thanks for allowing me to share. You know, I do what I do because of, of, of people like you. And so it just means a lot that you made time for this, and I hope you benefited from it. I'd love to hear, you know, one thing you took from this, tweet at me at John Gordon 11 at J-O-N Gordon 11 or on Facebook. Just, just send me, like, one thing that you're going to take away from this that you're going to act upon because – when we leave events like this or, or talks like this, the research shows if we try to do three things at once, you have about a 30% rate of success. This is Covey's research. If you just do two things, about 55% rate of success. But if you just pick one thing you're going to do differently, one act, 97% rate of success. So what's the one thing? I'd love to hear from you, and thank you so much.